Today in the studio, we talk to Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers. So one part, one answer, is to teach the military and police what is really constitutional and what's not, get them to stand down. But the other side of it is, is we have to stand up. Michael Bolden joined us in studio to discuss the organization he founded, the 10th Amendment Center. So nullification, which is the idea of doing anything with our states on a state legislature or even jury nullification to render a particular federal law null and void or unenforceable in a state, um, that's our duty. Also in studio today is Brandon Smith, writer and activist. We discussed real life solutions to help people survive today's unfolding economic crisis. We need to attack the problem on multiple levels. Uh, we need to go after the Federal Reserve um, at the federal level. Uh, we also need to institute Tenth Amendment legislation at the state level. And we also need to uh, pursue private barter, private commerce, to protect ourselves at the local level. Hello friends, Alex Jones here coming to you from our new studios here in Austin, Texas and I'm excited here in our inaugural uh, first show to have Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers. Stuart's a really amazing guy, he's a, of course a former Army paratrooper and he's a graduate of Yale Law School, a constitutional lawyer. He also worked uh, for several years in Congressman Ron Paul's office. But I think the most important thing he's done is found Oath Keepers. All across the United States, uh, they've educated hundreds and hundreds of thousands of uh, military and millions of uh, veterans, both uh, currently serving uh, and former military, who've now gotten out of the military. And, uh, it's been said by many historians that tyranny is going to come to your door in a uniform. And if we look at what happened in Eastern Europe or what happened in Eastern Germany with the fall of the Berlin Wall and before that with some of the resistance movements, time and time again it was either the military and the police that oppressed the people or that stood down and allowed liberty uh, to basically uh, win the day. And anybody who studied history or even has any basic common sense knows that we're losing our basic liberties in this country and that an organized, despotic system of autocratic control is being established. And so for the next 25 minutes or so, we're going to be talking to Stuart Rose, the founder of Oath Keepers. And while he was uh, here in Austin, part of a speaking tour uh, he's involved in, he brought a few of his associates, Brandon Smith, who's working on alternative uh, grassroots uh, uh, currency systems or barter, and also uh, Michael Bolden, Tenth Amendment Center, uh, really defining what is Tenth Amendment nullification, not the demonization we've seen from George Soros and the private Federal Reserve that's hijacked our federal government, uh, but from people that have actually really studied what the Founding Fathers said and what the Constitution and Bill of Rights states. And so uh, without further ado, Stuart Rhodes, great to have you here with us. Pleasure, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Break it down. I mean, there's so much we can talk about. Why do we need Oath Keepers? Uh, what are the 10 orders you will not follow? Why did you found this organization? Well, the critical thing is, is as you said a minute ago, tyranny can either come in the uniform or it can die by the uniform. If the military stands down, just simply says no and withdraws their support, as was done in 1989 in East Germany, the, the tyrant, no matter how bloodthirsty they are, cannot do it without them. In that situation, there was an order to suppress peaceful protests. The commander of the military refused to do so and ordered his men to stand down. And two days later, the wall fell. And in fact, we have an, an interview, a video interview on our website with a former East German lieutenant colonel who's now a Texas Oath Keeper who was there when the wall fell. And he describes very, 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 uh, very vividly how they just simply stayed on base and that was it. The Stasi secret police after that were hiding, tearing off their uniform badges, trying to pretend like they were just average soldiers hiding among the people and they were powerless. Before that they were feared. They were the finger. You know, no one could, no one could do anything to them or touch them. And now without the support of the military, they were nothing. And we saw the same thing just happen in Tunisia. You had the, the dictator there order the military to fire on the people. When the military refused and stood down, the dictator in Tunisia was forced to flee the country. They could not do it without them. So that's the first part of our mission, is to reach the current serving, remind them of their oath. In this country, we have something they didn't even have in East Germany. We have an oath to the Constitution. And we have a very clear set of rules of shall nots in our Bill of Rights that they're supposed to be protecting 
and refusing to violate. And so we have our declaration of, of, of orders we will not obey is really just a, a restatement of the Bill of Rights of things that they should have learned in school long ago. But we were never taught these things in school. They intentionally dumb us down in public schools and don't teach us our own heritage and our own constitution. So we're going to fix that. We're going to go teach the troops what they already should know. They already have the courage and honor. If they have the knowledge, then they'll do the right thing. Now, in the a couple years that you guys have been uh, active, you've had a huge effect, and I've seen it on the street. I've witnessed it with my own syndicated radio show, but also when I've traveled around the country. But the big indicator of the fact that you've hit a nerve and really the weak spot on the belly of the dragon is that the federal government, the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, the ADL, the George Soros type groups, uh, Rachel Maddow, they have gone absolutely ballistic with you guys. Uh, all you're saying is police, military, read the Bill of Rights, read the Constitution, uh, study you know, what this country was founded on. Uh, I know that even until just the last decade, there were large courses taught when my grandfathers were in the military all about the president isn't a dictator, Congress declares war, uh, you are not to follow an order uh, that violates law. I mean, because coming out of World War II, we just seen Nuremberg, where thousands of these Nazis got up and were shaking in fear, saying we were ordered to arrest people, we were ordered to take property, we were ordered to take people away, to work them to death and to shoot them in the back of the head. And um, that common law understanding came to the fore again that just following orders doesn't cut it. I mean, if I tell one of my employees, go down to the corner liquor store with his 357 Magnum and rob them, and then the cops catch him, they don't say, well, my boss told me to come, you know, rob this liquor store. Uh, it just doesn't work. And uh, there are a lot of people that join the military for the right reasons. That's the vast majority. But clearly, some people join it because they have these visions of, you know, being a tough guy involved in combat. And it seems like the system tries to go in and pick out some of those more sociopathic types. The same thing happens in law enforcement. But but looking at the numbers, uh, the vast majority of Ron Paul's presidential uh, donations from the military, the vast majority were to him. And I've talked to the military. I've talked to police. By and large, they're some of the best people in America. And I think that you've basically found the Achilles heel of the system, Stuart. So let's talk more about what's happening in America that illustrates, from your constitutional law perspective and as a veteran, that illustrates historically that tyranny isn't down the street or over the hill, it's knocking on our door. And now is the time for the American people to reach out to the police and military. And now is the time for the police and the military to make a decision historically, to look at the facts and to decide which side of history they're going to be on. That's right. Well, well, relentlessly since World War II especially, but even long before that, has been the creation of an infrastructure of totalitarianism in, in the United States. And people say, well, that's ridiculous. Well, look at the claim power of the president to intern any American citizen as an unlawful enemy combatant. No, no indictment, no grand jury indictment, no jury trial, just whisked away to a brig and then tried before a kangaroo court of officers selected by the president. FDR claimed this long before him. Lincoln claimed this power. Supreme Court rule was unconstitutional, but FDR tried to do it again. And that Supreme Court, the New Deal Supreme Court, rubber stamped his claimed authority to bring the international laws of war home to the United States and apply the international laws of war, which you would use on a foreign enemy, and apply it to the American people. That's the claim. And Bush grabbed the same claim power and expanded it even more in the, in the nebulous war against terrorism. If he says you are an enemy, then he could detain you and try you by military tribunal. That was his claim. The Supreme Court, unfortunately, rubber stamped that in the Hamdi decision. And then you had Obama come in, and he went even a step further. You're not even going to get detained or even, even tried by military tribunal. He'll just have you um, assassinated, have you executed by predator drones. Including U.S. citizens. Oh yeah, any, any U.S. citizen he thinks is an unlawful combatant, he has a secret list of Americans he wants to kill, and his claim is, is that the Supreme Court can't even see his list, that no one's allowed to see his list, it's on his authority alone, we must trust him to be picking out the right targets. But the fundamental problem is, is they're trying to say that, that they can treat an American the same as a foreign enemy, as though we were like occupied Japan or occupied Germany, or as though you were an Iraqi or an Afghani on the battlefields of Afghanistan or Iraq. They're, try, they're saying they can use the same power there here at home in the United States. Well, we'll talk about this more later because I want you to continue. But, but 
earlier you were on my syndicated radio broadcast and we were going over the Associated Press article uh, with Bernard von Nuthaus, 13 years issuing his own competing private currency, totally legal. You actually have the U.S. code right there in front of you. Uh, they convicted him with a kangaroo you know, f federal jury uh, of uh, counterfeiting. And then the prosecutor said, this is a great victory. We're going to infiltrate these groups as, as if people are hiding. And we're going to stop these uh, domestic terrorists uh, who are competing with the Federal Reserve. But it's the Federal Reserve itself that is the counterfeiter. They haven't been in control of our currency since 1913. You know, the dollar says Federal Reserve note. It doesn't say U.S. note. It's not backed by gold or silver. But I want to cover that more later. The reason I brought that up, Stuart, is that since they passed the Patriot Act more than nine years ago, since its passage, I constantly see articles out of Alabama, Texas, California, New York with similar headlines. Police and prosecutors use Patriot Act in thousands of non-terror related cases, marijuana, domestic disputes. They are overturning our entire system of checks and balances and admittedly using all of this new anti-terror law uh, against the general public. And if you read Section 802 of the Patriot Act, it states that it's for the general public. I mean, this, this is really tyranny. And that's what Oath Keepers is there for. When you talk to a group of police officers and military men and women, what do you say to them? What I tell them is, is that, look, the powers that were, that were being expanded, the powers of the government that were expanded in the name of fighting against Islamist terrorism are now being swung inward on us. And I use the, the MIAC report that you helped expose. Um, I use the DHS reports on returning veterans. And they, they get it. They understand. They can see that the current crop in the, in white, in the White House and, in, and in, in charge of the government, they can see that they don't like them that most police officers are veterans. So they, they do get it. Right now we have a window of opportunity to deprogram them after the indoctrination of the Bush years to just go along with a lot of this stuff. So they see that that Southern Poverty Law Center's characterization of veterans and, and even I mean, even current serving military with the Oath Keepers, they can see it's, it's nonsense. And so they are starting to wake up and, and pay attention to what's really going on, is that if you dare to talk about or act like the Founding Fathers wanted us to behave as a free people, you will be demonized, you will be attacked, you will be, be labeled an enemy of the state and a terrorist. And the cops and the military understand what's going on. Well, going back to the Mayak report and subsequent reports that have been leaked, uh, there's a reason state police and federal marshals and others have sent me uh, these type of documents is because they understand how bizarre and Orwellian it is to say if you got a Ron Paul bumper sticker or an American flag or get us out of the UN uh, or if you want to end the private Federal Reserve. I mean, it's so indicative of how illegitimate the power structure is and the private interests that have taken control of Washington are that they see the police and military that are awake as their enemy. Because they are tyrants, they are criminals, they are usurpers. And so in truth, good, red-blooded American police and military are the enemy of the New World Order. So they're really tipping their hand there. It's just that police and military who are not awake to this, who haven't been informed, who haven't been able to see my information or your information, they're really in the dark. But that threat is still there even if they're ignorant. So that's why I want to ask every person out there watching this at PrisonPlanet.tv or on YouTube and across the web, send this to everybody you know. Send this video and send this link to your police chief, to your sheriff. Burn it off on disk. Hand deliver it to them. Because if we can reach out to our military and police and show them the historical facts of what we're covering and show them that history is repeating itself, it's a major checkmate to the globalists. Go over... Uh, some of the 10 you know, orders that uh, you guys will not follow? Well, number one is we will not obey orders to disarm the American people. And this is something we saw happen in Katrina. I mean, as on Bill O'Reilly's show, he's like, oh, when's this ever going to happen? I said, well, it just happened. And then he said, well, it's a state of emergency, so of course you have to do that. And I said, well, a state of emergency doesn't cancel the, the Second Amendment. And so, but the problem is, is the mindset out there of people like Bill O'Reilly and many other you know, mainstream uh, Republicans is that, well, when, when there's a really a bad emergency, then we set aside the Constitution. And that's upside down. The whole point of the Bill of Rights was to be there when we're afraid, when we're scared, when we're angry, and to stop us from doing, like, it's like the werewolf, right? Lon Chaney, chain me down, 
When I go crazy under the full moon, I'm going to do, you know, wrong things. That's what the Bill of Rights is supposed to be, is, is the chain to chain ourselves down when we're afraid. You need the First Amendment and Second Amendment and the Third and Fourth and Fifth, especially during wartime and during emergency. That's what they're for. And so all we're saying is we will not violate our Bill of Rights. We won't obey orders to conduct warrantless searches on the American people, as the NSA has been doing now for years. You know, that, that was one of the reasons why our forefathers rebelled against the crown was the writs of assistance, warrantless searches. You know, we will not obey orders to detain American citizens as unlawful enemy combatants or subject them to military tribunal. Article 3 of the Treason Clause mandates a civilian trial and two witnesses to the overt act when you're accused of making war against your own country. That's the constitutional remedy, not spiriting you away to Gitmo or, or just a military brig in South Carolina where you don't get a lawyer. So we won't do these things. We will not obey orders to impose martial law or a state of emergency on, on a state. Article 4, Section 4 makes very clear that the, the U.S. government can't come into a state without being invited by the state legislature or the governor. And just to briefly interrupt, I want you to go back to that. I remember going to urban warfare drills 12, 14 years ago, uh, different events, and seeing the military train with role players to fight the American people. And I've studied enough history to know, wow, this is treason. This is dangerous. Uh, this is what's happened in every other country over and over again, especially third world nations. And I came out and made films like Police State 2000 and others. And people keep saying, when's the martial law coming? Well, the martial law is coming when the TSA says, we don't care if federal law says we've got to have radiology tests on these machines. We're not doing it. We don't care if local prosecutors say it's illegal for us to stick our hands down people's pants. And FBI agents can't even do it. We can. It's an emergency. Uh, we don't care uh, if you have a right to your bank account. It's an emergency. We're going to hold those funds. We're already being eased into this emergency atmosphere. They're never going to call it martial law. We're being just phased in incrementally into it right now from my research. Stuart, from your deep research, uh, do you concur with that, that we're basically already in uh, the first stages of what could be really deemed classical martial law? Well, in, in part, what they've done is, is claim that through emergency powers of the president that he can do things that, that, you know, through executive order or by fiat that otherwise are nowhere in our Constitution. Or if the U.N. gives him the authority, he doesn't have to go to Congress for a new war. Right. So that's, that's partly true. But true martial law is where they, where it's, it's the will of the commander on the battlefield. And they have made this claim. That's what Bush claimed, is that he can bring the international laws of war and apply them to the American people. That's martial law. That means that he can treat you the same as though he were a tank commander in, in the Iraqi desert and you're some local villager. His claim is he could do the same thing with you that he could do over there as commander in chief. And there's a legal precept there, because, and explain this to me, because I, re I remember three or four years ago, the head of the Air Force was uh, in the news saying, we've got to use these microwave guns against the American people because under Geneva, we can't use them against populations in Iraq but he was reversing that, saying laws of war, if we can use them on our people, mm -hmm, then right. that changes things somehow, and then we can use them on the Iraq. Well, what he was saying was is, is, is if, if we can use, and we can, supposedly, the laws of war against Americans who are unlawful combatants, then of course we can use them on Iraqis. But see, what they're doing, though, is, is they're, they're just sweeping away the Bill of Rights. The claim is, like I said, is that they can, they can treat us all as though we were foreign enemies in wartime and apply international law, the law of war, to us. And with that what that, so that, that was the undercurrent belief, the NSA spying on Americans, or in that situation there, they said, oh, look, you know, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to, you know, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply at all. This is war. This is not uh, an exception under the Fourth Amendment for criminal law. This is a whole new paradigm. This is simply the laws of war. And that's the claim. So see what I'm saying? And they notice we have the drug war. And we have the war on illiteracy, and it's all for a federal power grab. They always use this term war right. uh, as their excuse to basically have a power grab. Well, they do that in conventional law also. Uh, the claim is, you know, in the war on drugs, we must allow asset forfeiture, for example, to seize uh, the, the, the proceeds of, of drug crime. And then, they, then they wind up using it against a man who, who was out, you know, trolling for prostitutes. And they, and they take his wife's car. That's what was the case the Supreme Court upheld. And so it winds up being for this particular really bad thing that it expands out. Well, the same is going on in the war paradigm. There's the normal legal paradigm that they've chipped away at the Bill of Rights, but now there's this war paradigm where it used to be you could only use the laws of war against a foreign enemy. They now say, well, oh, but this one foreign enemy was a U.S. citizen. 
this is World War II, the, the, the um, eight German saboteurs, one of them was an American, he came ashore to, to blow up factories. Well, they tried him by tribunal, only one man. And then that case, that, that upholding of that trial of an American citizen under the laws of war sat dormant, almost forgotten until after 9-11. Then Bush reached back and, and reactivated that idea and said, oh yeah, in, in, in the war on terror now, which could be almost anything, terrorism is, is a tactic. Now we can use the same claim power to try any American we accuse of terrorism. And then at the G20 a few years ago in Pittsburgh, uh, some of my crew got arrested. The military just went and told the local police that my guys were terrorists and the police came after them and, 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 and interrogated them and said, were you planning to attack the military? And my guys were there publicly with their press badges, they're interviewing people. And when they were arresting uh, the, the college students, the college students hadn't even been demonstrating. They were outside at a park eating, and the police could find no one in Pittsburgh that dare break their Tiananmen Square type order that no one could be outside during the day or night. And they would just come in and attack the, the uh students with enjoyment and they arrested Rob Dews over there running camera right now and when they got him to an old uh, uh, prison they had the military and police there and were bringing in some of the protesters with bags over their heads and the police were really enjoying this and we got footage all over the city of kids even playing with balls outside at like three four in the afternoon and loudspeakers saying no one's allowed to be on the streets and we saw YouTube videos of women coming out of stores, older women with bags who'd been shopping. And they're like, officer, I'm shopping. And the cop says, I don't care, and releases a police dog on them. So uh, we're seeing this in Toronto. They did the same thing. Uh, a year later, we're seeing it in Pittsburgh, where they're setting the precedent in England, where, they're at, where they actually have beaten people to death who were just delivering newspapers. They just say, we allow no one to be outside while the banker heads are meeting in this town. And the police from all over the country travel there to mix with the military and private contractors. And they were there snatching protesters randomly to terrorize everyone and throwing them into unmarked vehicles speeding away. I mean, if that isn't martial law, Stuart, what is? Well, they're, they're behaving as though they were in a third world junta. And you can look at what's being done in Central America or in the Middle East or any place like that where there is tyranny, and that's the future unless we stand up and stop it. So one part, one answer is to teach the military and police what is really constitutional and what's not, get them to stand down. But the other side of it is, is we have to stand up. But that's my question to you, and, and that's why I'm basically you know, interrogating you on these facts. I don't want you to go over the rest of them, is I know a lot of police and military individually are good people. I've talked to them. But when they get into mob psychology, they followed orders in Katrina to go to the high and dry areas. And Not all of them did. I know some said, no, I want you to speak to that. Right. And, and the media didn't want us to know about that. And that was a beta test. But when I see something like what happened in Pittsburgh, the military and the police waged war against the people, and it was all orchestrated to, 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 to chill political free speech in this country. So, so, so respond to that. Well, sure, they're being conditioned. I mean, they've been conditioned for, for decades to serve under UN command, for example, and you had only, only Michael New, one man out of his whole battalion, stood up and said no. And so we're trying to counter that conditioning. And now they're being conditioned to be used here at home. Not just Katrina, but also, as you know, you know NORTHCOM and, and the 1st Combat Brigade to the 3rd Infantry Division is being assigned here at home. And assigned deals to use foreign troops in America. Well, we we had some during during Katrina. There were there were Mexican troops that assisted. So there and and they you know, of course you know before long, you exposed a long time ago that these agreements with Canada to bring troops into into the United States. And we're seeing reports all the time of increasing activity of foreign troops. Just the other day, I got a I got a call from a guy in Tennessee upset about seeing Canadian vehicles running around the rural. He was a cop. He he didn't know why they were there. His local sheriff got angry. two years ago. We had a state rep on in Tennessee. They had a gaggle of more than ten federal agencies shutting down major highways. The governor said, "You can't do that. Get out of here." And Homeland Security said, "Go to hell." Right. So now they I mean, I mean, we're talking checkpoints, and now they're Paul Watson in Northern England. They had uh, Eastern European Ukrainian troops in a UN event running checkpoints. This is happening everywhere. Well, certainly. So the conditioning, they're, they're flipping the founders' design on its head. They're taking away the sovereignty and the independence of the local police departments. They're making them subservient to, to, the, to Washington, D.C. They're sending in liaisons from the military to work with the police, to condition them to work together, all the things you've been exposed the to. The threat fusion centers. 
Sure, the fusion. I want to go over that, that, but I interrupted you. you. You said, "Hey, some some people said no at Katrina." That's right. We we had a video. We happened. Sergeant uh, um, Sheriff Mack and I were doing a tour through Utah, and it stumbled on this one sergeant. His name is Joshua May of the Utah National Guard, and we did an interview with him, and he talked about in his unit from the Utah National Guard when they were deployed to Katrina, he and his entire unit refused to comply with any orders to confiscate firearms. They went to their commander ahead of time in a preemptive refusal and said, if you give us these orders, we refuse, we will refuse to obey them. And then the commander said, well, hold on, let me ask Big Army. So he sent the word up to the Big Army that they wouldn't do this, and the word came back, well, tell them, don't worry, we won't ask them to do that. So Big Army blinked. And why did that happen? Because Sergeant May was that one guy who was an outspoken constitutionalist. And so when the time came for that critical decision, the officers in his unit came to him. And even though they were lieutenants and, and captains, they came to the, the, the sergeant and said, Sergeant, will you please go talk to the commander? So he was the one who went over to talk to the commander. So one man in the right place made a critical difference. So our goal was to create- Well, one man place. who's in the right is a majority. That's right, has a, has a moral force far outweighing his numbers. And so, so there's an example where because he did convince the others in his unit to go along, he did what unfortunately Michael knew was not able to do. An entire unit stood down and they did not court martial him. They didn't say anything about it. Amazing. Stuart, I want to get your guests in here in a few minutes before we run out of time, and we could talk forever. That's why I'm always honored to have you on the radio show. The website is oathkeepers.org, also operationsleepinggiant.com. Speak more about the orders you will not follow, other points you want to make. I'm going to try to give you the floor, even though this is so intriguing and I've got a lot of questions. Uh, and, and then we can get emailed questions later. And the next time you're back live on the radio, we can uh, you know, take those other questions then. Okay. Uh, but then tell us more about operationsleepinggiant.com. Well, the, the focus there is, as like, like I said before, we can't just say to the current serving, oh, please don't violate our rights while we sit here on the couch and, 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 you know, and eat chips and watch Dancing with the Stars. Us veterans especially, but all Americans, have a duty to stand up and to restore the republic from the bottom up. All the institutions the founders intended us to use to be sovereign citizens. We must restore our, our state militias, we, even down at the county level. We must constitute sheriff posses to back our sheriff up. An economic collapse is coming. The veterans in this country have got to wake up and take personal responsibility for keeping their oath to defend the Constitution, and the way they do that is by strengthening themselves, their communities, and their states to get ready for the coming storm. And why that's so important is that when the storm comes, when the collapse comes, if we are strong in our states and our communities, if we're independent and self-sufficient, then they, there's no pretext to send in federal troops. If we're strong and independent, then the federal troops will go look at it and say, wait a minute, Mr. President, they don't need us. They don't need us and they don't want us in their state. And their governor's telling us to stay out. That's right. The globalists are counting on us being domesticated in organized chaos. And for those that don't know, you're not just making this statement here that the collapse is coming. We have the IMF World Bank documents from 2002. We've seen what they've done over and over again. We know their stated goal from Maury Strong to the UN to the entire White House. They want a post-industrial world. They, it's the Wall Street crowd that's not free market waging war against independence. They want a vertical integration. They want to consolidate. Explain to people how important uh, this, uh, this collapse that we're already in uh, is because the system is planning to use it as their pretext to totally take over. Well, they're letting us know right now, the IMF chairman has already told us they're going to replace the dollar as the world reserve currency and use the special drawing rights as the interim currency on the way to an official global, global currency. So they're telling us you know, what, they're, what they're going to do. And so it's as though we're on the, on the Titanic. It's already hit the iceberg. They've steered us into the iceberg. And they're going to sink the ship, which is our fiat system that we're riding on right now. And then we're floundering around in the water. They're going to show up with the, with the UN and Leviathan. It's going to come, and they're going to say, oh, come aboard this. This is your salvation. The next step is a world Federal Reserve. And they're telling us that's our only salvation. Well, the answer is, is to get back to the USS Constitution, which is still seaworthy. Old Ironsides is still right there. Let's get back to that, fix the sails, patch any holes, and sail at home. That's the answer. Get back to the Constitution. And that means sound money in our pockets. That means sound money in our states like Utah just did. That means revitalizing the, the military power of the people in our state militias. And that means get, making sure we're squared away with 
alternate communications, so when they use the internet kill switch, it won't matter, because we'll have our, our alternate system set up. And that means becoming strong in our states, having strong sheriffs who will do what Sheriff Max has been urging for years and stand up, and strong legislatures that will say, no, we will, we will stand in front of you, as Michael Bolden's going to talk about here pretty soon, we will stand in front of you as a shield under the Constitution and enforce the Constitution. If we don't preserve our state sovereignty and our national sovereignty right now, if we don't stand on the principles of the Founding Fathers, if we are weak and allow ourselves to be suckered in to this next stage of a world Federal Reserve, then liberty will die worldwide. Very well said, Stuart Rhodes. Anything else you want to add? Well, a key, a key provision here that, that dovetails very well with the Tenth Amendment Center and why I'm part of the Nullify Now Tour is number five, we will not obey orders to invade and subjugate any state that asserts its sovereignty. Because be that is the constitutional that. solution. Now, we've got the provisions. Uh, the, our founders went through the exact same garbage we're now going through. And every culture goes through this. That's right. I, I mean, the, the very same private central banks, even some of the same banking families that we're now fighting today are the people that our ancestors 235 years ago were fighting. It's, a, it's incredible. And they gave us the blueprint for resistance. They showed us the way. Everything in our Bill of Rights is the answer. Speak out. They knew. They built this bear trap for the New World Order. They understood. They talked about it. I mean, it's incredible. The fight is on because other countries and nations have been successful. They've been wealthy. Most of them have not been successful because of tyranny. But they never have had any of the freedoms we've had because of the vision of our forebears. And now these two ideologies of liberty versus tyranny, the culture of 1984, the boot stomping on the human face forever, is colliding with the spirit of 1776. It's our turn in the barrel. And it's our turn. Everybody is at that crossroads, Stuart. I mean, we're here now, yeah. and it's time to choose a side. I hope everybody out there watching researches this information and realizes you're part of history. Don't just sit there on the bench. Now is the time. I mean, I'll quote Braveheart uh, you know, from the movie Braveheart. Don't sit there many years from now lying in your beds uh, wishing uh, that uh, you could you know, come back here and tell our enemies they can take our lives, they'll never take our freedom. But the secret is you don't, most of you don't have to give up your lives. You know, people give up their lives to get some oil for the bankers or, you know, to go overthrow some dictator 5,000, 6,000 miles away. Why not just stand up and be in the spotlight and go to your city council, go to your legislature, go speak to your police chief and continue to mainline the idea of liberty because we've got the winning ideas. We've got history on our side. We're the good guys. And as long as we stand up and are bold and don't hide our light under a bushel, we can't be beaten. You know, the tyrants are trying to intimidate us right now because they're scared, Stuart. That's right. And they're trying to make us fear for our own safety. But the answer to fear is love. And the strongest power we have is love for our children and our grandchildren. And as Thomas Paine said, if there is going to be trouble, let it come in my day so my child will have peace and freedom. So that's our answer is stand up, do it for your kids. You know, a woman whose, whose children are, are being attacked by a bear, she has no fear. She'll, she'll throw her life away for her children. That's the, that's the spirit we got to have, that you're defending, because what's what you're really doing? You're defending your children and your children's children. So if you stand on that, on that kind of uh, posture, fear won't, won't bother you at all. That's what courage is. Absolutely. We're joined now by Michael Bolden, and he heads up the Tenth Amendment Center .com. And Stewart's traveling around the country uh, with Mr. Bolden and a lot of other great uh, lovers of liberty uh, as part of the Nullify Now Tour. And uh, Michael Bolden, good to have you here in studio with us. Glad to be here, Alex. We've only got about 10 minutes. Uh, we could probably talk for 10 hours. So I want to try to give you the floor and then any final comments uh, by Stewart concerning nullification and how it is one of the main keys to restoring our republic. Uh, because the federal government has obviously uh, been usurped by foreign corporate globalist interest. Then we're going to bring in Brandon Smith, who's also part of your great tour, uh, to break down something we can do at the grassroots level to also diminish the power of the private Federal Reserve and the banking cartel. So you've got the floor. Tell us about nullification. It's getting demonized. I mean, they're they're saying that this is this is more evil than kryptonite. Uh, that this stuff. Uh, you know, basically is Satan itself. But when I read the Bill of Rights, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, that's all I hear about. So I guess they're saying our American system is what's so devilish. Well, you know what? The peace president bombs countries around the world. 
the drug war wage, rages on, the Patriot Act exists, bailouts, mandates, regulations, they never seem to end. The Fed prints and prints and prints and prints. And we have an essential question that we need to answer, and Thomas Jefferson answered this question back in 1798 as well. When government does not follow the rules given to it, and for us that's the Constitution, so there's uh, certain rules, certain things that the federal government is authorized to do, what do you do about it? Do you march on Washington, D.C. on a date like September 12th? And do you beg federal politicians to limit their own power? Do you go to federal courts and do you ask federal judges, oh, limit the federal government's power? Do you vote the bums out in the hopes that the new bums are going to say, you know, all this power that you've given us, we don't want it. You know, have it back. Well, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison both warned us that if the federal government ever became the sole and exclusive arbiter of the extent of its own powers, that power would always grow whether we had elections or protests or separations of power or any other vaunted part of the American system. So uh, in 1798, in response to what was known as the Alien and Sedition Acts, Thomas Jefferson wrote, and uh, James Madison as well, the, the, the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And they said, uh, or Jefferson wrote, he said, a nullification of the act is the rightful remedy whenever, now every single time, the federal government violates the Constitution. He didn't say it was just a good idea to stand up and say no in our states, uh, you know, after we voted some bums out or went to court or protested. He said we were supposed to do it as it happened. So nullification, which is the idea of doing anything with our states on a state legislature or even jury nullification to render a particular federal law null and void or unenforceable in a state, um, that's our duty. We're supposed to do that as it happens. We're not supposed to wait two or four years for an election for new bums to come in. We're not supposed to wait six years uh, for a court to get to the a case to get to the Supreme Court so some federal judges can give us permission to exercise our rights. We're supposed to stand up for our rights and exercise them in our states and in our, in our communities, whether they, the government, want us to or not. And it's awesome to have someone like Stewart on board as a sponsor and as an anchor, as the major speaker uh, at our Nullify Now tour, uh, putting this into the mainstream discussion. I mean, you talked about how this is this is really irritating the mainstream. I mean, just this this week, Rachel Maddow over at MSNBC had did a 15-minute special about how people who support the Tenth Amendment Center, people who are standing up for nullification, they're evil, like you said. We must be interested in owning black people because somehow, some way, if you if you want to decentralize, you don't want the central control over every aspect of your but life. But it was states' rights that first really got abolition going and gave it its power. Yes. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. The reality is, is you know, in our government-run schools, everything's been twisted around. They tell us that don't want government-run uh, healthcare, don't like black people. Well, absolutely. You know, that's, <laughs> they're like, what does it have to do with that? Well, they tell us that the, the Civil War was, was uh, about nullification. Well, the reality is, let's say everything that they say, everything else is right, and that uh, the, you know, the South only wanted slaves and nothing else. Well, what would they have to nullify? The Constitution at the time allowed slavery. They weren't nullifying. In fact, South Carolina's Declaration of Causes for Secession, it's available online, really easy to find. Their official document to say why they seceded. They give a long explanation about the structure of government, and then the number one complaint they had was those darn northern states were trying to nullify the Fugitive Slave Act, which was requiring or trying to require northern states to send black people back to the south into slavery. And by the way, anybody who takes even high school history knows that. They know full well. It's just a good throwaway line. But regardless, this is 150-something years ago. What people need to understand is the federal government itself is openly a cash machine for the Fortune 100 that have come in. We have a private central bank that issues our currency and credit. They have used us to fund their operations, to, to be their military force. Uh, we owe over a thousand trillion dollars that we've supposedly signed on to through derivatives. That's the issue. The federal government with unfunded mandates is destroying the states. And the federal government has got involved in everything, in what kids eat in school, uh, in what the road signs look like, in speed limits. They don't have this business. And if, if somebody reads the Constitution, Bill of Rights, it's all right there. And the fact that if you go back to 1913, the same year they gave us the private Federal Reserve and its taxing system of the income tax, they also got an amendment passed to take U.S. senators, I think this is key, away from the states. Previously, the legislature, elected by the people, would then vote and would have a U.S. senator that was their creature. 
And if they didn't do what the state said, they were removed back to the state because there was a separation of power. That's how much power the states had and that they controlled the U.S. Senate. And you're not getting anything through Congress if you don't control the Senate. But since then, they've made them creatures of the Federal Reserve. And that's why they did that. And so I would answer Matt Alback, well, why then did we ever have senators at the state level sent by the states? We understand what's happening. They've taken the power from the states to the federal government, now from the federal government to the globalist, and that's what's happening. And so thank God for nullification. We need to have the states stand up for their rightful uh, liberties of the people and cut the head off of the snake Pulling the rug out from under them. That's Absolutely. the reality. And you know, James Madison was a pretty smart dude. You know, and in Federalist number 45, he said the powers uh, given to the federal government are few and defined, and those left with the states are numerous and indefinite. And those few and defined primarily Article 1, Section 8. And if you look at Clause 3, the Commerce Clause is the one that they twist And the people over don't like over. it, they don't like America. Well, you know, you hate America if you want the freedom to choose the size of your toilet or what plant you can grow in your backyard and consume, or if you don't want to go overseas and kill millions of brown people for the for the elites in Washington DC you hate America and you hate freedom well the reality is it's really the other way around and I think more and more people on the grassroots are getting sick and tired of it and that's why this idea they don't want us to talk about nullification we're doing it anyway well tell us short short and sweet for new listeners or viewers what is nullification and what's its progress right now nullification is the idea that when the federal government passes a law which is really no law at all. It's a usurpation of power. When they pass a law that's a violation of the Constitution, it's your duty in your state to do something, whether to pass a particular piece of legislation to reject, to say it's null and void, it's of no effect, to prevent its enforcement in your, in your state. And it has a lot of progress right now. People are really waking up to this idea. There are 15 states that are defying Congress and the Supreme Court on medical marijuana. They say that we can't have a plant in our backyard and grow it and consume it. Well, we're doing it anyways. There's 25 states that have rejected the Bush era Real ID Act. And, you know, they keep having to, uh, you know, push it off and push it off and push Hundreds it off. Hundreds of cities are rejecting the Patriot Act. Absolutely. That's the same concept. We can even go down to a local level. There's been eight states that have passed a Firearms Freedom Act that say that if you make a gun in your state and you sell it in your state, federal government, get the hell out of here. You can't do it. Absolutely, and just passed, like Stewart said, just passed in Utah, a sound money bill. The Tenth Amendment Center also authors legislation. We have a Federal Health Care Nullification Act to reject not just Obamacare mandates, but the entire idea that the federal government should be involved in health care at all. And by the way, by the way, I want to ask both of you this. How, and viewers out there, how discredited is Obamacare, written by the insurance companies to force 35 million people to buy an overpriced product, allows the insurance companies to start telling doctors what they can and can't do to reduce their cost, and now thousands of major companies like McDonald's are given waivers to not have to buy it. Stuart, I don't have to be a lawyer to know this, but you're a constitutional lawyer. Is that not true discrimination? We always think of discrimination, black, white, or things like that. What about economic discrimination? That if you're a government insider or you give money to the Democratic Party, or when the Republicans are in power to their party, you get a waiver. You don't have to buy this insurance, but the hamburger place next to McDonald's that's owned by, you know, uh, the Rhodes or the Johnsons or the Sanchez's, they've got to go and buy the insurance. I mean, that's incredible. Well, it is, but unfortunately the courts have, have, uh, have not um, found things like that to be unconstitutional as, as, as corrupt as they, as they may be. But at least one federal judge did realize that compelling you to go buy insurance is, is, is unprecedented. They're not just saying you can't do something like law usually does. It's saying you must go do something. So even a federal judge, as, as, um, as indoctrinated as they are to believe in, in expanded power of the, of the state, couldn't swallow that. Well, and that's like the Soviets. They would say, you know, uh, every week on these hours, you've got to come help dig ditches on yeah. top of all your other jobs. Yeah. And, and, and just like we see now in Chicago, parents can't pack their kids' lunches, and they say you can't be trusted. So, I mean, we are literally becoming complete vassals. Right. No, nothing that we don't let you do, you're allowed to do, and, and all the things that we say that you should do, you must do. So they're flipping in, on, on its head the idea of freedom. But I think they're rushing so hard in this power grab that it's doing the opposite. It's accelerating an awakening. So then the control freaks, the state is pushing even harder for more control, and then that only accelerates our awakening. And then they get even more panicked and more brazen and more naked. 
finish up with where this movement's going. You were you were already breaking it down. It's very I mean, exciting. It, it's endless. It's not left versus right. It's us versus them, as you know. Well, and of course, they want to keep us in this box. And uh, while we keep fighting against each other, they keep taking more money and more power for their friends, for the general electric, electric types, for the war profiteers. But the reality is, is we're trying to reject the TSA. We're trying to reject the Patriot Act. We're working on nullifying national health care. We're working on nullifying the use of our state's guard troops overseas to occupy foreign countries. And there's bills introduced all over the country to do this. Some of them are already passing, as we see, we've seen success in, in issues like marijuana and the Real ID Act, and we can And it's apply. a process. The states are now rediscovering their power. They're learning about it. You know, what's happened over the last few years, more and more state reps are contacting us saying, well, what do we do about, uh, I don't know, constitutional tender, or we want to grow hemp in Kentucky. Well, write a bill, or we'll provide you. We have tons of them at 10thamendmentcenter.com for all kinds of different issues. We'll provide you a bill to introduce in your state, pass it, say, we're not going to allow federal agents to stop our farmers from growing hemp. And if they try to, we're going to arrest them and put them in jail. And that's what we're seeing all across the country. And we see Texas saying, the TSA. we're going to... Well, not just TSA, uh, you know, that they'll start arresting these TSA agents when they, when they molest people, but Texas is saying, we're going to keep our coal-powered power plants. Oh, yeah. We, I mean, because because Obama couldn't even get Congress, much less Commerce Clause. He, he couldn't even get Congress to pass a law to do it. So he ordered his executive branch minions, the bureaucrats, to do it. And Texas is fighting that. I mean, it, it's I see it every day in the news. The fight is on. It's exciting. And the bushfires in the minds of men are being lit by people uh, like both of you gentlemen. Any closing comments on this subject? Alex, we need your help. You have been out in the forefront reporting on this state sovereignty and nullification movement, and we need you to keep pushing it because every time you talk about it, every time you interview someone like Charles Key or Randy Brogdon or Sam Rohr or Matt Shea or Susan Lynn or all the number of great state reps that you've had on over the last few years, we get so much contact over at 10thamendmentcenter.com. So we want to know what we can do to support these state legislators. Bottom line, the patriots are getting organized. The system is scared because they know that we found one of their major weak spots. And they're jumping the shark in reaction. Whenever they start labeling someone who is simply growing a pot, or pot plant in their backyard as, as an enemy, or, or labeling Von Nothaus, who you know, simply had, had sound money in his pocket as, as a terrorist, things like this, labeling veterans, returning veterans as suspected it, terrorists. It, it lets everybody know we were right. This, yeah. this whole Patriot Act's for us. This is a tyranny. And they wake other people up. They, and it becomes so absurd and so ridiculous. Like I said, they're jumping the shark. They're going such, a, such an absurd length. They have to because all we're doing is defending what's really constitutional. They're absurd tyrants, and so now the absurdity of them defending what they're doing is becoming Kafka-esque. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just it's, it's, it's beyond 1984 in so many respects. I mean, the White House comes out this week and says, yeah, we're, we're going to hold your passcodes for your computer and your bank account. We're going to watch everything you do. And, and, and e even mainstream media universally said, this is absolute police state. And, and they think they're going to be able to chill our speech. They think Americans will cower in fear. But the exact opposite has happened. Truth is, Americans have just been decadent and lazy. Once Americans get roused, they're ready for a fight. Right. right. And the more All they're doing sleep. is waking up the sleeping giant. That's exactly right. They're, filling, they're, they're swelling our ranks. They're showing that the, the truth, what we've been saying for years, what you've been saying for, for a long time, and they're, they're, just, they're demonstrating it. They're saying, like you said earlier, they're showing that it's all actually true. And they think they can say, well, yes, and we're going to do this, this, and this to you if you do. Anything. And this guy put out silver coins. He's arrested. He's a terrorist. And marijuana's terrorism. And, right. and we, yeah, we got blimps watching. And yeah, we're listening to you. But it's not a police state. But you said five years ago you weren't spying without warrants. Shut up, conspiracy theorist. But it's not going to work. It's not going to, not going to suppress us. It's By the way, in that article I had earlier when you were on the radio with me, in that story where they have the Commerce Secretary and they've got the Cato Institute and all these big groups saying this is a total power grab, takeover, Internet ID, Internet kill switch, it's all in the White House announcement. The Commerce Secretary came out and said, you're a conspiracy theorist. They never intellectually debate us. They just have a throwaway line of, well, yes, you'll have a government-issued ID to do anything on the Internet, but you're a conspiracy theorist. It doesn't work anymore. No, it doesn't. The website for the Tenth Amendment Center is 10thamendmentcenter.com, obviously. Oath Keepers, oathkeepers.org. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, Michael Bolden, for joining us. Now we're going to bring in Brandon Smith. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. Well, Stuart, why don't you introduce 
our next uh, guest. Well, this is Brandon Smith, and he writes, he did write under the pen name Giordorno Bruno um, on economics. And We posted some of your stuff at InfoWars. So. Yeah, for, yeah, for a couple of years now. Yeah. yeah, very good stuff. And so when I saw him, uh, I could tell he was a, a person of uh, sincere belief in freedom and consistent, and I approached him with the idea of um, starting a movement, a grassroots movement, to get people to decouple from the fiat system, to unplug from the matrix. So I kind of lit a fire into him to start the alternate market project, and, and uh, now we're doing it. Now this is what Gandhi did. Uh, for those that don't know, Gandhi peacefully, it took him over a decade, said stop buying from the British. Stop supporting them, just turn your backs. Basically don't serve them when they come into your business. Uh, they're here occupying us, uh, this isn't going to work anymore. Support your own local community. Yeah. And this idea is really scaring the system. So before we get into his decentralized model, let's talk about what happened to Bernard von Nothaus because uh, they're now calling this guy who for 13 years put out a competing currency, uh, was not counterfeit, and they're saying that it was counterfeit and they found a moronic federal handpicked jury uh, to convict him. So, so both of you break that down and let's go through your alternative uh, model that you cover at alt-market.com. Well, what the U.S. Attorney Ann Tompkins did uh, essentially was take a, a very broad statute um, dealing, dealing with uh, the making of gold and silver currency and uh, interpreted it to, to mean almost any uh, flat metal token or coin to be counterfeit. Um, Nothouse, Nothouse made a few mistakes. I think um, he used certain language that insinuated or that, that it could allow people to insinuate that he was counterfeiting. But if you look at his coins, um, he, he, none of them look like legal U.S. tender. Um, well, he was also attacking uh, the Federal Reserve and openly saying we need to have alternative well, currencies. He was, and he was going further. He initiated a lawsuit against uh, yeah. the, the, the federal government um, right before, uh, ironically, that they raided his, uh, raided Liberty Dollar yeah. and, and took all his... But the, only, but the only thing he did on his coins is he used the term dollar and he used the dollar sign. And I've seen that on casino chips right. for decades in Las Vegas. And so really the, 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 what they did is they took a vague federal statute that used to be used to go after real counterfeiters, and now they're going after him for what you just said, because they don't like what he's doing, because he's giving people an alternative of using real money. That's the real threat. Well, plus, p people are counterfeiting the counterfeit Federal Reserve notes. It's self a counterfeit item. That's the big joke here. And right. so it's not like people are out there counterfeiting silver and gold coins. Right. I, I mean, this is insane. But uh, let's continue with them saying he's a you know, special type of terrorist. This sets an amazing precedent. Right, right. They uh, actually, in the post-trial statement from Ann Tompkins, she says, uh, attempts to undermine the legitimate currency of this country are simply a unique form of domestic terrorism. While these forms of anti-government activities do not involve violence, they are every bit as insidious and represent a clear and present danger to the economic stability of this country. We are determined to meet these threats through infiltration, disruption, and dismantling of organizations which seek to challenge the legitimacy, which is very funny, of our democratic form of government. Wow. So, so by challenging the Federal Reserve that hijacked us 100 years ago, 98 years ago, it, if you even criticize them, they're saying that you're an enemy they'll infiltrate. That, that sounds like Cass Sunstein. Or, or China. China just said they're going to arrest people who, who reveal accurate economic information that might hurt the Chinese economy. Our government's saying the same thing. If you, if you even just use legitimate currency, that's undermining it. Right, and, and the, the, the Nothaus case was, you know, not about counterfeiting at all. It's really about people using sound money in their communities and in their states. That competes with the fraudulent Federal Reserve exactly. system that's going the way of the Weimar Republic. I want to give you both the floor now to break this down, uh, and we've only got about eight minutes left, and to uh, go over your alternative that's completely decentralized and that this Death Star system can't stop. Well, Alex, what we're doing with Operation Sleeping Giant is telling veterans they have to focus on four key areas. And with Brandon and I, with Alternate Market also, which is his effort, 
is, is take the same thing, the same message. There are four critical things that must be in place for us to survive an economic collapse and be free. And the first one is you've got to have food security, you've got to have emergency communications, um, and also uh, emergency medical and other preparedness. Because food's the hardest thing to improvise. But the second thing you've got to have in a hierarchy of needs is physical security. We're talking neighborhood watches and sheriff's posses and a revitalization of a real county militia. You've got to have your own state security so you don't need outside intervention from the feds. And the third one is, is economic security, which is Brandon's going to cover here next. You've got to have the ability to, to uh, barter and, and trade with each other. And the fourth one is state sovereignty. That's why I'm part of the Nullify Now Tour, and we just spoke together here in, uh, in Austin at the Nullify Now uh, event here. And so those are all critical things, but I'll let Brandon talk about the alternate market project and that one particular prong. Well, the bottom line is if communities don't take back their commerce, uh, they're going to be completely dependent on the Federal Reserve and the dollar. Right now we're seeing an extreme devaluation of the dollar. We're seeing inflation. Um, most commodities have doubled in the past two years. Uh, if communities remain hooked to the dollar, they're going to be desperate and they're going to go along with anything that the federal government says uh, when the final collapse occurs. So what we are proposing is that communities take back their commerce, um, they institute local barter networks and trade. Um, along with that would, would come sound money um, and at the state level sound money legislation. Um, well, I mean, the main thing is, is that as individuals um, and as neighborhoods and on up, from in, the one pillar would be public action, going to your town council and your county government and saying, please use gold and silver, for example, going to your state legislature as Utah just did. So that's public. But the other side of it is don't, you know, don't rely only on that. Also work in the private sphere. As individuals, as families, as neighborhoods, co-ops, farmers markets, support your local economies, all the things you can do even outside of government to make sure that you're strong. Stop shopping at Walmart. Shop at the local grocery instead. And if you can get a list of folks' names, say, hey, you know, go to your local grocery and say, hey, all of us in this community will, will patronize your store. We will not shop at Walmart if you'll start taking silver currency, for example, and, and, and you entice them to, to help you deplug. Help us shop at your store instead of Walmart. And a lot of people have taken the first steps towards this, and that includes prepping, storing foods and goods, um, storing uh, materials for self-defense. Um, the, the problem is that this isn't going to be enough. People need to start building community and uh, looking out for each other. And uh, the, the, the idea of the, the lone wolf uh, survivor out in the hills is just not going to cut it anymore. Um, so what we're, what we're proposing is people really get out of their houses, start thinking about um, working together within their communities. And uh, it only takes two people to start a barter network. Um, and then hopefully, you know, that the person you're working with brings in his friends. And maybe they bring in their families. And you grow and you grow and you grow. Um, that's really the goal here. We need to attack the problem on multiple levels. Uh, we need to go after the Federal Reserve um, at the federal level. Uh, we also need to institute Tenth Amendment legislation at the state level. And we also need to uh, pursue private barter, private commerce to protect ourselves at the local level. So what we want people to do is go to alt-market.com uh, we've launched a website. It's a networking website. You can go on. You can meet people in your in your local area who are also interested in bartering, who are also of like mind, uh, interested in sound money. Uh, you 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 meet with them. You start working with them. If you if you if you like who you're working with, maybe you can grow your grow your uh, network more. Um, it doesn't have to be huge. It could be small, or you can or you can take it to the state level. What we really want people to do is is start pursuing a state-level barter system. Uh, for instance, the great, during the Great Depression, California, the state of California alone, had a 300,000 member barter network. So uh, this, these kinds of things pop up, barter networks pop up after every economic collapse. Um, the problem is they always institute them after the fact. What we want people to do now is preempt the collapse that we know is coming and insulate themselves. Well, Brandon Smith, I really appreciate you coming in the studio. Thanks and for having me, Alex. You bet. It's very exciting the tour you guys have got going. And I know uh, 
They say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. I hope other folks pick up you know, the historical uh, information you're putting out and spread it to everybody else because nobody can stop an idea whose time has come. Uh, it was Victor Hugo who said no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Folks, uh, again, thank you for watching. I hope you get this information out to everybody. This information can save America, save the republic, and defeat these globalists. It's time to defeat them. Ideas are bulletproof. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds? Go to InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv for the latest headlines and cutting-edge information.